It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Serge Panther, PhD in molecular biology from the Université Catholique de Louvain. Dr. Panther is a serial biotech entrepreneur and investor. Dr. Panther joined UCARE in two, 2021 as a chief scientific officer. UCARE uh, is the most impressive venture builder in the life science in Europe, uh, backed with uh, 60 million euro uh, private funding. Uh, it's a, it's a, its job is to, to, to create a biotech startup with two hot domain of expertise. We'll talk about that. Nice to have you, Dr. Pamphol. How are you today? I'm, I'm doing very fine, Harry. So I guess we can work on a uh, U basis and two as in French. So uh, please feel free to, uh, to use a, uh, a very friendly and fluid way of interacting because of course, uh, of course. I think it has been a long time since somebody called me doctor. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in in our world, it's it's really on a friendly basis, and I'm very happy to join you. Thank you very much. It's an honor to have uh, you. It's, it's, a, it's a great honor to have you based on your great experience. Uh, it's uh, it's a very important for me to have you today. And this interview, if you allow me, would be in two parts. The first part, we'll talk about a little bit about yourself, about your path into science and entrepreneurship, and then we'll talk more in depth about your care and uh, what you do as a CSO. So, if you agree, we can start. Perfect. So, how did the young uh, Serge, who was finishing his high school, uh, see his future? Did, did you already plan to become, I don't know, a researcher or professor at the university? Or, or at, the, at this moment, you were already knew that you, you can do something with technology and entrepreneurship? You see this book? L'Aventure de la Terre, yes. So that's the book that I received as a gift when I was nine years old. Wow. Okay. And page number 19 was about dinosaurs. <laughs> And that was my defining moment. Mm. At that time, I was nine years old, and uh, I decided to become a dinosaur hunter, mm. a paleontologist. So for different reasons, I didn't be became, become one. Uh, I became uh, an embryologist. And there is a link between paleontology and embryology, which is that if you look at how an embryo develops, you would recapitulate in a way the uh, the uh, you know the way species have evolved have evolved from uh, amphibians and fishes and mammalians. So there was uh, I'm not going to go into the details, you know, explaining why I didn't pursue paleontology, but uh, um, that's the way I try to solve my problem of knowing very early on that I would become a, a biologist and and you know and having my trajectory through different steps. And um, yes, today I still have this book with me. I have even two copies of it in case I would lose one because that's really the stone, the, the springboard onto which my entire career and even my life as a person was, was defined. So uh, it was very early on and I'm fortunate because in a way uh, I didn't go through all these hesitations and, and wanderings that many adolescents uh, go through and to try to uh, find out what they would do with their life because in my way it was clearly defined very very early on. So you were already fascinated by uh, the life and how it evolved uh, from the dinosaur from the bacteria to, to, to complex organisms such as us and even dinosaur who are this, this extinct now but so then you joined the university you studied science uh, life science and what I want to understand is um, so you wanted to become a researcher. So you have a, maybe not a clear idea what a researcher was at, in high school, but during your study at university, certainly the, the idea was more clear. But at the one point, you know, you you you, you shifted into entrepreneurship and biotech entrepreneurship. How was how the the, the eureka moment established in your head, or, or was it, or, do you have an eureka moment? Did you have an eureka moment? Uh, eureka, eureka, yes, yes, and no. Uh, there is something that I believe strongly uh, in, and that's the concept of serendipity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and by the way, that's uh, the Eureka moment is exactly a good example of serendipity because uh, Archimed was working for a king who was trying to find a way to, uh, to verify if uh, his, his, um, his collaborators were not stealing gold from him. Now, when were they doing when they were designing his, his crowd and something? So he was really, as a consultant, Archimed was really thinking about how to solve that problem, playing around with the concept of uh, density and volume and weight, and trying to find a formula 
who would bind these three concepts into one, into one equation. Uh, and serendipity is really something that is driving my life a lot. Serendipity is also what is, I guess, driving science a lot too. And uh, I would say that I'm fascinated with everything that is about to start. Embryos is a good example, and that's why I was so fascinated in embryology. But startups is exactly the same. A startup is, is the beginning of something, right? Is the beginning of a company, is the, be the beginning of a venture. So uh, that's why I am really focused on intellectually and also very pragmatically. I'm really interested in the beginning of something. And then I guess uh, my attention span being kind of short, I believe I get bored at some point and then I'm very happy that other people will take over. And that's exactly the same with the company when you start to grow a company and become very serious about the business side of it. I guess that's when uh, my attention span start to flick a little bit and I'm very eager to, uh, to move on to something else. And uh, uh, I did that for 15 years before joining uh, UACare because I've been the CEO of a biotech incubator mm -hmm. in the French speaking region of Belgium, uh, working with the uh, five different French speaking universities that we have in our in our country, and it was all about uh, now finding ways using the incubation model and also acting as a seed investor to build startups. And then, then at some point, I guess, uh, you know, what the startup would become was less of my focus, and I would be very happy to move on to the next project and the next project, and so on, which is uh, well, something very, you know, very exciting to do. I mean, uh, when, when you wake up in the morning, you basically know what your day is going to be about. So for you, um, it was natural from your PhD and postdoc to, to move into a create, the creation of a startup because it was the same process intellectually. And, uh, and by the way, did you have some support at that time from your university, your laboratory? Because, uh, you know, entrepreneurship in, in Europe is something very new. I remember when I finished my PhD uh, in 2007, we didn't know what startup was at that time, and we didn't have we didn't have in France any ecosystem. Yeah. So. Okay, I mean, it's a it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I did my postdoc in the US, right? Just at the moment when biotech in the US was becoming was becoming a big story, with uh, venture capitalists injecting a lot of money in companies like Amgen mm -hmm. or Genentech. So it was really the very beginning of it, and and during our lunch break. At, in, 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 at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine when I was doing my, my postdoc, we were asking ourselves a lot of questions you know, among ourselves. And one of the questions was, uh, who are the scientists who are leaving the ivory tower, who are leaving the academy to join those biotech startups? Are they the good ones or the bad ones? It was a great question because you know, we were working you know, our, you know, thousands of hours to, 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 uh, you know, to, to, to find stuff in molecular biology to understand, uh, I, I know in, at my time it was the focus was really on cytokines and receptors of those cytokines being maybe involved in cancers. So it was like opening a big space. We were talking about apoptosis, you know, cell suicide. I mean, how does that work and why and so on. And that there was this background question, uh, which was, I mean, okay, we are supposed to be the best scientists. Are we, you know, what are we going to do now? So when I moved back to Belgium and I very, very early on, I was about, you know, starting startups. And, uh, and at the time, my university that you have mentioned, but I, want, I don't want to, to bath mouth it because they have produced great startups later on. But when I was discussing with officials, with the dean of the faculty of medicine, for instance, about creating startups, because I was bowling with ideas, they said, no way. I mean, this is public money. To do you know research and you owe it to the public to, to, to do everything freely with no capitalistic ID in, in, in mind. And that's one of the reasons why, although I was professor at that university with a full tenor, I decided to leave the Ivory Tower and jump into the biotech industry in Europe in that case. It was out of curiosity, it was out of frustration, but it has also a lot to do with serendipity because just at the moment when I decided okay, I have enough, I want to leave. I mean, somebody approached me with a great job at, at a startup in, in Berlin. And, you know, I was prepared to accept that offer because I had done all the, you know, the intellectual work to prepare myself 
to, uh, to leave the academy and to join the industry. So it's uh, like a combination of many things, but curiosity and serendipity were a big, uh, you know, a big, a, a big uh, energy source for me to do that. Uh, this is very important for the audience, so particularly our scientists who, who will watch the, the, the video. Uh, it's very important to see that you are a pioneer in the, in, the, in the life science entrepreneurship at the moment that the ecosystem was not maturing for it was emerging, but it was not mature. So you, have, you certainly faced a lot of challenge and issue during this early moment. And I, what I would like to, to, to know if this talent that you saw and you overcome at that time as an entrepreneur uh, can also um, um, happen again for, for entrepreneurs now and uh, how you can help them to, to, to solve this, this challenge if they are recurrent challenge or they are new challenge. I don't know, maybe certainly both. I think passion is, is a great thing because, you know, passion believing in what you do or in what you want to do and the reasons why you want to do it is just what keep you what what keeps you moving right mm -hmm. uh, so you may have barriers in front of you you may have hurdles uh, you know on the road but that does, that doesn't influence you in a way because you are so moved so energized by by passion that uh, you know it doesn't matter mm -hmm. um, that being said, there is certainly a certain level of uh, realism, of pragmatism that you have to, to be able to accept uh, when, when you're in a startup, because indeed the startup is at the crossroads of different uh, interests. Mm -hmm. I mean, the people who are going to give you money, the investors, uh, they do it for a specific reason, which is not exactly the one that you as a scientist willing to save the world has in mind. So um, one of the uh, key success factors in a startup is that people understand each other. Absolutely. That people understand that maybe they are on the same boat, they are embarked on the same boat, but with slightly different um, destinations. In a way, providing a return on investment is not exactly the same as finding the cure uh, to diabetes mm -hmm. or to cancer, but, you know, it, it's the magic is actually to combine these different uh, uh, stakeholders. I know before being shareholders, you are a stakeholder, and, uh, and and to combine these different and to be aligned. And if it works smoothly, I mean, if nobody is in a denial, I mean, the investors have to accept the risk of science not delivering because the hypothesis was not completely uh, correct. And it's up to the experiments actually to tell us if the hypothesis is right or wrong. So the investors has to go, you know, a number of miles to other scientists to understand how science works. And the scientist in return has to understand that it is more about applied science than basic science. Mm. Uh, and that there is nothing wrong about that. That's how people are supposed to work together. Uh, and it's a team, team thing. And there is a lot of respect there is a lot of alignment, and that's why governance in, in, in a startup is, is a key element. And we'll get back to that maybe uh, later, because uh, as a scientist, um, I also had to understand how a, a startup operates and uh, towards success and governance, the way uh, directors, executives, founders, how they have to combine their expertise their experience, their smartness, their vision together into one entity, that's really key. So uh, there is a lot of psychology being the CEO of an incubator and now being the CSO of Eurocare is 50% uh, uh, psychology, 45% anthropology, and 5% science. And all of this equal Culture, culture, because I know you are very committed in culture also to promoting culture. So we, I would love to talk about this point, but we, the timing is short, but uh, it's very important to establish a corporate culture as soon as possible, a very good corporate culture. But we will talk about offline uh, about the culture because it's a very important point. So after 15 years of being the managing director of a, of a leading um, uh, life science bio biotech incubator, the, the WBC, you, you then joined it as a CSO uh, of UK, uh, what is UK? Uh, because it's a very um, 
a bold and uh, you know impressive entity uh, for promoting the creation of licensed companies. So uh, please explain us what is UK. Well, Eurocare is an investment uh, company, so it's not a fund, uh, meaning that we work in, in a slightly different way uh, than venture capitalists would, would do, or investors, or seed investors, or even business angels would do, in the sense that we are working as a studio. Mm -hmm. So if, if, you, if you look at the traditional value chain, you would have a scientist who makes a discovery, a finding in his lab, and then he would secure the IP together with the TTO at the university is working at, and then those people uh, would knock on the door of the incubator and say, we have a solution looking for a problem. Mm -hmm. And the best way to explore which problem to solve is, uh, is uh, through the creation of a startup. And then, you know, and then you start assembling the different blocks it takes. The studio works the different in a different way. It's not exactly the reverse way, but it's about identifying a problem first. And then once you have a problem that you have decided to spend energy and time and money and whatever on it, you find the best people in the scientific world who may help you address that problem with a new solution. So it's really about a problem looking for a solution. Okay, and it's only when the proof of principle of the new technology has been achieved and is convincing that you think about yes or no, you want to start a company. Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. So in a way, um, this equation where you have risk and reward and, and, and proof of principle and market traction, for instance, all these blocks exist in the incubation model, but the way they are ordered, the way they are assembled, the, the, the methodology is slightly different. And we believe that working as a studio instead of incubator is going to uh, increase the rate of success and decrease the rate of attrition. But at the same time, uh, we are still very much open to the different models. Uh, and it's just a trend, I guess, that today um, we are still very much open to scientists who have found something useful, but we want to work uh, with them very early on and not wait passively as an investor would do that the company has been legally created and so on. We want to be involved very early on. And, and second, with time, I guess that our portfolio will be more and more and more uh, according to the studio model and less according to the incubation model. And that's why we are also investing a lot of uh, resources in a intelligence, artificial intelligence based platform that will help us with all these different steps that it takes before you create a startup, which is the ideation, which is uh, finding the best people, matching the scientific founder with a business person to make sure that the business model with it is it, is it going to be a service company? Is it going to be a platform company? Is it going to be a product company? All these aspects are being analyzed and taken into consideration very early on, even before we start talking about a startup. Even before thinking about the solution, you're already thinking about um, how, uh, first of all, I resume um, with, with, with your, let's say, Artificial intelligence will analyze everything, the publication, um, article news, um, new, uh, social network, everything. You can, you, can, you can identify societal problem that worth to be solved, right? And this is different between the, the old school, let's say, uh, uh, technology push innovation, which first by research and development, we find a solution, a technical solution to a technical problem. And then we, we, we expected to, 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 to apply this technical solution to a societal problem. And sometimes that work and sometimes doesn't work <laughs> due to you know, the high rate of failure of startup, as we know. But you have reversed the, 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 um, the, let's say the process by first identifying a societal problem worth to be solved, right? Yes, okay. and, 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 and to use synthetic or to apply synthetic biology as a, a box of tools uh, to uh, to finding a solution that is superior mm. 
-hmm. to the existing solutions or even better when there is so no, no solution at all to come up with something and that's that's the the one of the key differentiators so basically we have uh the fact that we work as a studio like like you mentioned the the fact that um, we are our own startup so we share with the uh, with the founders and the entrepreneurs this same mindset this same spirit of, of starting something uh, and then using synthetic biology as as a toolbox mm -hmm. to uh, to try to come up with proof of principle and with, with technologies that are being validated but that are based on synthetic biology uh, as much as possible I didn't, I didn't mention in the introduction that you have two domains of expertise right now. It's synthetic biology and microbiome. Uh, could you please explain us uh, what are, why, these, why these two um, domains, uh, era of expertise? And uh, of course, for me, it's evident, but, but I would like to hear it from you. Why, why did you uh, choose to, 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 use this, this, to focus on these two era? And what are the possible outcome for, for us as a human being, as, as a patient, as a, as a benefactor? Of... Yeah, I think it's, there are many reasons for that. I mean, the investors who invested in, in, in UK in the first place, uh, they, I guess, were very impactful in terms of uh, telling us where they want the money to be invested in. And uh, I, I think a, a big part of the reason why we choose those two fields Uh, you know, is, is just a consequence of them telling us what was their vision and, and, and where they, they, they really want to, uh, to, uh, to, to be impactful. So that's thing number one. Very uh, matter of fact, if you look at market uh, growth and, and, and growth rates, uh, you see that microbiome and synthetic biology are two disciplines, there are two sectors where uh, the, uh, the market growth rates are expected to be more than 25% on an annual basis, which is huge. Mm. And third, on a more personal uh, level, I know in my life as a scientist, uh, I went through two big uh, game changers. The first one as a discovery was apoptosis. Mm -hmm. you know, the fact that cells may decide to commit suicide and the fact that cancer cells are completely unresponsive to that signal. Apoptosis was like opening new doors because we all knew necrosis, but nobody was suspecting that apoptosis would be an active mechanism involving enzymes, involving signals, and being kind of like very complex in a way, right? And also in terms of technologies, I was fortunate enough to be one of the very first persons to use PCR, mm. which was an invention. So, discoveries, inventions, going together to make things that were not possible before their, uh, you know, their, their, uh, their discovery and, and, and findings, in a way. So um, I think synthetic biology is a tool, so it's a technology. Microbiome is more discovery, I mean, discovering that we are full of bugs mm -hmm. and that those bugs have, have some uh, very uh, precise functions to accomplish in, in our gut or, or skin or even in the environment because uh, we are very much interested in the uh, microbiomes in the ocean and the air to address environmental issues for instance so again it's a discovery and the microbiome is one of them it's a technology or an invention and synthetic biology is one of them and what i see in eurocare is in a way to uh, feel this excitement again Of, of playing with, with new things and, and put them to the, you know, to the benefit of society. And uh, yes, that's, I believe, my, my, my big motivator. And that's the small beauty that I do see in, in Eurocare, in addition to, on, on top of all these, uh, you know, fundamental reasons why we want to be in those two spaces, uh, you know, as, 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 an, as an investment company. Great, great. And you have already uh, launched uh, several uh, startups who are very amazing. I just uh, want to, to cite uh, DNA Script, a very, very impressive startup. Um, M-A-A-T, uh, Pharma, I don't know if I pronounce it well. Uh, many, many more. Uh, if you want, maybe talk about some, some if you want. Uh, they are very impressive startups and uh, very promising for, for the outcome that you can, they, can, they can bring us. 
the very good example in our case is is Omni, at least in in, in the uh, in the framework of this of this interview. The thing I would certainly like or prefer even to focus on Omni possibly in our portfolio because that's really uh, the great example uh, within our portfolio of the way we want to work mm -hmm. and. The way we want to work is really having uh, or working together with uh, uh, you know very bright scientists to identify problems and the problem that uh, Omni possibly is is addressing is to uh, to invent new nucleic acids with new functions or new characteristics so that they could uh, fill jobs that haven't been uh, invented by Mother Nature itself, which is for instance, to, to be able to store information in the form of, of DNA molecules. So uh, you could use DNA as it is right now with, with the nucleic acids that are available, but you can also try to come up with new nucleic acids who may be more extremophiles, for instance, and be able to resist conditions that uh, our existing DNA uh, was not meant to withstand, like acidity, or temperatures or pressures, uh, for instance. And uh, so this is really about bringing together scientists who are working in different labs. Sorry, if you allow me just uh, an analogy for, for, for people to understand. In, uh, I have, a, I'm based also in, in the southeast of France and in Swiss. And in southeast of France, we have sometimes canicule, which is a hot summer, uh, <laughs> and all our uh, hard drive can burn, you know, and you can't recover your data, but with the DNA, you will never lose your data. <laughs> Especially if you leave it in the trunk of your car, in the sun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, okay, but that's exactly a good example. Uh, like you say, it's a more an anecdote, I guess, but uh, indeed, I mean, we are facing issues about, about you know, the amount of, uh, of power it takes to uh, to keep all these clouds and servers uh, alive, in a way. So we need to find, you know, to be really innovative and, and disruptive in how we can do that in the future. Uh, and and if DNA or DNA-like molecules is a way to go, in the same way as mRNA is the new way to go uh, with respect to vaccines, for instance. Well, it's like, it's exactly the same line of reasoning, in a way, you know that. You, you, you find yourself with, with limits, you find yourself with priorities, how to come up with a new vaccine within six months instead of uh, two years. And then you say, okay, I mean, I, I have to, to shake the tree. You know, I have to trust something else. And it's uh, going back to this word of trust, building trust. Uh, and, and, and that's also one of the missions that startup uh, have to endorse in a way that they are a vector of trust between the technology and, and, and the public Absolutely. and the society. Mm -hmm. So it's all about vectors, you know, and you have to, to transmit things. And, and trust is one of them. Message is one of them. Hope is one of them. And, uh, and, and have, you know, people converging into a, a, a collective belief, mm -hmm. a collective trust into, into new approaches. And that's exactly what, what we are trying to do. Your care could be seen as, as a vector. Mm. Also uh, part of this trust building uh, challenge that we are facing. Uh, and when we try to address it in, in our way, which is uh, via ideation and via creation of startups and, uh, and connecting, being one of the elements connecting the dots society being the ultimate beneficiary of what we try to do. Very brilliant, and I'm totally aligned on that. We need to, to, to build this trust uh, with this amazing technology and, uh, and uh, know how you, you, you implement into your startup studio. It's, it's fantastic. Um, we are reaching the end of this interview. If you allow me, maybe two questions rapidly. Um, how do you envision uh, the exit of your startup? Do you, do you see them to become a big, big company by their own? And or is, is it, uh, are they, are there, their, let's say their path is to be bought by big pharma or big, big med tech? Anything goes. It's like children in your family. I mean, Absolutely. one may become a, a genius and a, 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 you know, a bright lawyer or something. And another one would become an artist. <laughs> well, if it is an NFT artist, then that's fine, I would say. But uh, no, it's, it's just, I mean, you have a portfolio, like you have a portfolio of children, maybe. You will have a portfolio of startups, and each of them 
is going to find their own key uh, to success or to be successful, which is bringing those technologies, those products, applications, platforms, uh, solutions, services to the market, right? Mm -hmm. Because that I used to say innovation is an invention that found its market, which is making money in a way, that money being re-injected in, in, in another cycle of, of startup creation, for instance. So uh, yes, I think anything goes because it's a case by case type of destiny or, or fate. Uh, some will be sold to a big company. Some will go to the IPO. Some will fail. Sure. And, and failing is also a way to learn and uh, contributing to the next success. Uh, so yes, I think that uh, there, is, there is no fixed rule. It's a case by case thing. And it's again, I mean, listening to a lot of people including the founders of the startups. Absolutely, this is very important because I, I wanted you to say it because for scientists who, would, who have dreamed to, to build a big company, they don't want you know, to, to be constrained in, in, a, in, a, in a path, in a, in a railroad. Okay. Uh, it's amazing what you say because you, you give them everything they need to become by their own big company if they wish, if they have the ambition, if they have the passion. So this is fantastic. Um, let's say to conclude this interview, uh, if you have, one or two advice for a PhD student, for a postdoc, or for a, uh, a principal investigator, or whatever. Who, who, we know who, who is uh, in the academic position or in the academic career, and would like to, you know, to, to follow you as example. How, how, what would be your your number one or two advice? Follow your passion, and keep an eye for serendipity. Mm. I mean, if something happens, if there is an opportunity, I mean, don't spend too much time analyzing it because uh, you won't do it. You just jump and dive and follow your passion and, and believe in what you are doing. And if you are a scientist, believe in what you have discovered. Mm. Uh, so I think it's very important to, uh, yes, it's fueled by passion. It's fueled by a little bit of craziness. Uh, it's fueled by by this this curiosity. It's fueled by many things, and uh, they are positive in their own ways. Uh, so just go for it. Perfect. Thank you so much uh, for being uh, my guest today. It was a great honor to have you, and hope we will discuss again and, and with uh, about this passionating subject. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Panfer, and uh, hope to see you in person uh, soon. Okay, I enjoy it very much also, and and and. Thank you to you for having this podcast. It was a pleasure.